Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Beginning Investors Group Online, also known as Big Online or the Big O. I'm your host, Dustin Griffin, and I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, especially all of our members and guests who are joining us and decided to spend their evening with us. Just so you know, the Beginning Investors Group is an online educational group for new investors who are just getting started in the real estate business, as well as new again investors who maybe have taken some time off and are getting back into the game. The entire purpose of this group is to help new investors get their first deal or help new again investors get their next deal. We attempt to do this by providing you with some really good, high quality, no cost training from some of the best minds in the business. And tonight's no exception. And I also want to remind everybody that we're now meeting on the fourth Tuesday of every month. It used to be the fourth Wednesday. And if you want to tell any of your friends about this group, you can have them register at bigo.co. That's bigo.co. Tonight we're broadcasting live from my office in Buford to Atlanta, Rhea, Tampa, Rhea, Charlotte, Rhea, Savannah, Rhea, Chattanooga, Rhea, and anybody else out there around the country or around the globe that may be listening in tonight. If you guys are interested in seeing some of our replays that we do every month, uh, once I edit the recording, I throw them up on YouTube as well as Facebook. So if you want to see them on YouTube, go to bigo.co slash YouTube. That is a shortcut over to our YouTube channel. Bigo.co slash YouTube. We also put them up on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash beginning investors group online. If you don't want to type all that out, just go to bigo.co slash replays. Bigo.co slash replays. That will take you over to our Facebook page. So I'm really excited tonight's topic. It's five secrets the banks don't want you to know with my good friend, Dwan Twyford. Dwan, welcome to the webinar tonight. Hey, thank you, Dustin. I am so excited to do this webinar. Yeah, it's been about a year since we've done one. And for everybody online that doesn't know you, uh, Dwan is an author, a mentor, and a full-time real estate investor, as well as a mom and a wife. She's flipped over 2,000 deals herself, so she's more than qualified to share her vast knowledge with you here tonight, and I'm really, really excited to have you. So once again, welcome to the webinar tonight. We really, really appreciate you being here with us. Yeah, no, I'm always, you know me, I always take time out for you. You're like my favorite guy. And I appreciate that. You, all, <laughs> you and your husband both take a lot of time out from us, for us as well. Uh, you just spent some time with us up in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Bill's been down here twice to Atlanta over the past couple weeks. Yeah. And uh, we missed you, of course. I know you weren't traveling with him this month, but uh, we're, we're so glad you're here with us tonight. And uh, I plan on seeing you this weekend here in Atlanta yes, at the Investor Summit. Yep, you are. You're stuck with me this weekend, babe. That's right. Two whole days. Speaking of this weekend... Everybody that's on the call, just so you know, um, Bill and Dwan are doing a two-day investor summit here with Atlanta, Rhea in Atlanta. It's going to be at 3125 Presidential Parkway. That's where we normally have our Rhea meetings, and it's two full days. And Dwan's going to be talking about this tonight, but in case you had to get off the call early for some reason, I wanted to go ahead and give you this URL if you want to sign up. It is summit dot atlantaria.com summit dot atlantaria.com so no matter where you're located whether you're in charlotte or chattanooga or savannah or tampa it's here in atlanta this weekend for two full days if you'd like to come up or come down and see us we'd love to have you um, it is 29 dollars for our gold members 49 dollars for our silver members and 99 for non-members and if you are a member those prices are good for two for one so you and your spouse you and your adult child, uh, or you and a parent could come for these prices. It's two for one special going on. Duan, you want to take a real quick minute to tell them what you're going to be teaching them this weekend in case they have to get off the call early? Oh my gosh, this weekend, so many things. We're going to be talking about uh, some really great ways to find deals that other people aren't using. We'll be talking about deals that have no equity, deals that have equity. We'll be talking about flipping contracts. Everyone's interested in flipping contracts right now. Uh, we'll throw a little bit in there about short sales, what some of the banks are starting to do again. And we'll be covering some of the scripts 
and it is just really going to be a fun, fun workshop. Yeah, I've sat through it myself several times. It is an excellent event. You guys are going to really, really enjoy it. These two, we call them the, uh, the uh, rock star real estate investors. They are a hoot, especially when they're tag teaming it because they are a husband and wife couple and they do this for real full time. Uh, they've both been doing it nearly 20 years, if not longer than 20 years uh -huh. and have thousands of deals they've done uh, among themselves. So they're highly qualified to teach you this business. And they also run Colorado RIA out in Denver. So they, like me, they know what their members need and want, and they know how to give it to them. And you're going to get a little bit of taste of that tonight. So thanks again for being here, Dwan. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. So for everybody at home, we've been using the Zoom webinar for a couple months now. And you will see that there is a Q&A interface, a little button on your uh, toolbar. If you have any questions throughout this presentation, send them in via Q&A and I will do my best to feed those to Dewan when she opens it up for questions. So you can start sending them in right away. Don't wait to the end. Send them in early, that way you're first in line to get them answered. So if you have any questions, please take advantage of Dewan being here with us tonight and her sharing her insights with you. I really do love questions. Um, I don't mean to sound cocky, but no one's ever asked me a question I couldn't answer. <laughs> so I've been doing it that long. But I really do like questions. And one of the things I find is for new investors, sometimes they're afraid to ask a question because they think their question is stupid. And you know what, guys? Dustin was new one time. I was new one time. We were all new. And there was no stupid question. So if you have even a question that you think, oh, man, there's a way I could ask this, I really do like to do Q&As. And please ask every question. And they don't have to worry about asking stupid questions on this webinar. It's not like we can see them, you know? And well, I usually only use their first name. Question. I mean, yeah. I, I, I remember starting and someone, I heard someone use the word REO, and I didn't know what they were talking about. And I sat there in this conversation with people for 10 minutes going, I don't know what these people are talking about. I was afraid to ask what it meant. Yeah, so, don't be afraid. That's what the Beginning Investors Group is all about. We're... Yeah. Catering to new investors, so don't, don't hesitate to ask. So are you ready to take the screen? I am. Okay, Let's so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit some folks here. Technology is not my, my, it's not my strong suit. Real estate investing is. And Dustin just showed me how to do this. So this, you are my first webinar on Zoom, Dustin. So if I screw it up, it's completely and totally my fault. Yeah, I've been using GoToWebinar for years, but I'm really liking this new Zoom. I have too. So I'm uh, already willing to accept full responsibility if anyone's computer blows up or something. Yay. I can see your screen. Can you see it? I can. Look at that. See, so what I'm, I'm new tonight. I didn't even start. What I'm going to do is mute my microphone. So All when right. I'm moving around on my chair, I won't disturb you. If you need me, holler. I'll be right here. And I'll be right. taking everybody's questions as they come in live. All right. Well, thank you, Dustin. And again, folks, I want to thank you for being on the call tonight. Uh, I always like to start off my calls thanking people for investing their time with me because I do realize how valuable your time is. And I certainly valuable, you know, know how valuable my time is. And I'm certainly willing to invest my time helping new people become successful. And I appreciate you doing the same thing. Because I always tell everyone, time is your most valuable asset. Because when you run out of time, well, you know how the story goes. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about five things the banks don't want you to know. Uh, I'm going to ask you to invest about an hour with me. And the things I'm going to cover tonight, I'm not actually going to cover this weekend. Because for those of you that are on the call and then come this weekend, I don't want you to have a repetitive session. So this is brand new stuff. You will not hear this weekend. This is for you all right now, special because you're here with me now. So, and the reason I'm talking about things that the banks don't want you to know, I'm going to cover tonight. Well, let me just start. Let me just say what I'm going to cover here tonight. Hold on. My screen's not moving. If you will click on the screen, not the Zoom interface, but if you'll click on the actual PowerPoint, 
it should uh, jump from, you see the arrows in the corner down there? There you go. You're getting it. All right. I got it. Okay. See, I was already busting a sweat right there. So, folks, like I said, technology is not, not, not my bag. <laughs> Real we'll have to have you turn on your <laughs> webcam so they can see you sweat. No, I'm actually like sweating right now. Oh, my God. My whole face just broke on the sweat. All right, guys. So, see, here's the great thing about what just happened. As a real estate investor, so many things are going to pop up and come up, and you have to be able to handle every single solitary thing without freaking out and just keep moving forward and keep rolling with it because that's how real estate is. you got to just keep rolling with it. So now that I think I'm rolling with it, we'll see what happens. All right. Hey, Whoopi, look at that. I figured it out. Whoop, whoop. Okay, so five things that the banks don't want you to know. I'm going to talk to you about three steps to supersize success. And I'm also going to share with you how you can close a deal in 37 days from today. So I don't know about you guys, but if you could close a $30,000 deal in the next 37 days, what would that do to you? Could you pay some bills, credit cards? I don't know, go on a vacation, come to a workshop. There's a ton of great things that you could do. So I want to uh, cover all these things, and then I'm going to talk to you about why we're specifically talking about banks. Okay, let's see. Oh, look, the next page. I'm so excited, Dustin. This is working. So what's happening in the real estate market today? Um, this is something I find out, you know, I, I teach a lot, and like Dustin says, we've been up there quite a few times working with him, and my husband and I typically speak at one RIA group a month, and I find out that people really don't have any idea what the heck is going on in the actual real estate market. So I want to just share a couple of facts with you. These are the sort of things that you should write down and you should know so that as the markets are coming and going, you know what's going on kind of on the backside of things. So since the crash, and the crash is over, the markets are great, everything's like, yay, the market's wonderful, everything's amazing. Well, again, markets go up, and then they're going to go back down, then go back up, blah, blah, blah. So right now, even though we're having a very good economy, we're having very low unemployment, you know, property values are going up, things are looking good, there's still, to this very day, right now, there's 20 million people that have no equity or they're in some stage of late payments or foreclosures or something. And I mean, so when I say no equity, state, whatever, so this is what I mean. If you have a $200,000 house and someone owes $200,000, they have no equity. By late payments, maybe someone's getting ready to fall behind on the next payment. Maybe someone just fell behind. Maybe someone just worked out a loan modification with the bank and they're behind on those payments. Or maybe they're already in foreclosure and the sale date is coming around the corner and they're going to lose their house. And I don't think people realize how many people are still in trouble. And yes, the real estate market appears, it appears to have recovered, but I'm going to share with you why it really hasn't truly. Also, in the next 12 months from today, 1.4 million people are going to file bankruptcy. I write this down. Well, just think about this. 1.4 million people are going to file bankruptcy, and 75% of those people file bankruptcy to stop that foreclosure sale. So whatever it's called in your area, where it's a sheriff sale, trustee sale, whatever you call it, it's the foreclosure sale. It's the point at which the bank says, okay, we just took this house back, and you need to gather up all your things and move the heck out. Okay, so, and the banks don't want you to know that. 75% of all the people that are filing these bankruptcies, mostly Chapter 13s, they're doing it within 72 hours of the sale date. So if you are in an area and you have foreclosure sales on Thursday, Monday, 75% of the people that get ready to lose their house, they're down at the courthouse filing bankruptcy at the federal building. So you should be working not only the foreclosure files, you should be calling the people that are in bankruptcy. Most of the people, the other 25% filed bankruptcy because they're just buried in debt. They really want to get out of debt. But the other 75, 75 out of 100 that file, 
are doing it to stop the sale. So that is a wealth of people that need your help right this very minute, but the banks really don't want you to know um, that that's why there's so many foreclosures. Another thing that the banks don't like you to know is they don't want you to know how many houses they have in the inventory. So the reason the market looks so great today, like you go out and you're like, oh man, property values have gone up. They've doubled in my area. I can't believe it. It's so great. Well, if the banks had to take every vacant house that they have and put it on the market right now, we would have the biggest recession in the history of the world because we'd have so many empty houses and there's not enough buyers for them. So the banks control the inventory. How many of you have driven by houses and you see, well, they maybe don't look exactly like the one in that picture. That looks like the house in like the Adams family, actually. <laughs> but you drive through what I would call like a level three neighborhood. Level three is, you know, it's, it's like a good solid blue collar, nice neighborhood. Drive through the level two and the level three neighborhoods and you look at how many of those houses are sitting there empty. So by not putting them all on the market, it's causing the property values to go up because it doesn't seem like there's enough houses so people are paying more. But if the bank was forced by the government to put every house you have on the market right now, it would be such chaos, we would not, we would not even know what, where we're living. It would be that big of a disaster, okay? So it is important for you guys to know little things like that. That's why I love to find vacant houses. Every time I buy, every time I find a vacant house, this is what I do. I put a bandit sign in the yard of all the vacant houses. And this is something that nobody else teaches. I don't think anybody else does it. Bill and I started doing it first about six or seven years ago. And we were out door knocking and we like to go door knocking. We like to talk to homeowners. And we saw so many vacant houses that specific day. And I said, man, we ought to be putting signs in all these yards because these houses are empty and people are driving by these houses, going home every day, and they're seeing all these houses. They'd see our signs and maybe they will call us. So we started putting signs out in the yards of vacant houses. Now, these are houses that do not have a real estate agent sign. They're just completely vacant. You can look at the door. You can see all the stickers on the door. And it's obvious that it's a vacant property. So we started putting signs in the yards. And so, um, so you know, Bill and I always test our numbers. I mean, everyone, you know, in any business that you're in, if you're on an airplane, you count how many people are on the plane, average it by the weight in the bags, and, you know, two people have to move to the back, or one person's got to go to the front. Numbers are everything. Numbers are your business. So we tried. So we had been doing this for a few years. And we said, you know, let's just track this for the next couple months. Let's just see what happens. So we found out that for every 13, now think about this, for every 13 bandit signs that we put out, we get an average of 200 phone calls. So I don't know where you can go and advertise and put 13 I Buy Houses Cash signs in yards and get 200 phone calls. It is the highest return for the money of anything that we've ever done since we both became real estate investors. So I'm just gonna have a fun with you for a moment. Don't use this sign. You know what's wrong with that sign? It's on a telephone pole. So those pity, those folks that drive around the cities and they give you citations and fines because you littered, they know you don't own that telephone pole. So if you put your sign on a pole, you deserve to get a ticket. Do what I'm telling you. Put them in the yards only a vacant properties because it's a vacant property. It's private property. The, the people driving around looking for things to write tickets for, they don't know who owns that house. They don't know if that sign doesn't belong to the owner. You put a sign in your own front yard and people call you from it. People can't stop you from putting signs in yards. That's why we do it because you get a ton of calls, can't get in trouble, no one's going to yell at you, there's no sign police, and nobody knows who owns the yard. Then we have the investors I call the overdoers. They just bombard yards. They'll put like 25 signs down the yard, down the block, around the corner, like on the sidewalks and the medium strips. Don't do that. 
That will get you in trouble. And then this is my personal favorite. These are the people that have been to some seminar and somebody said, oh, make handmade signs. It makes you seem more real. Folks, I've been doing this 25 years. That sign screams to me. I don't have two nickels to rub together. So if I'm so poor I can't buy a sign, I sure as heck can't help you with your property. None of those, and if Dustin, if you've ever taught them that, I'm sorry, I'm vetoing that. No handwritten signs. They're so, I can't even scream the level of tackiness that they are. And they honestly, they look you, they make you just look so unprofessional. Hey, and I agree with you. If, thank you. The only so, time I ever even suggest or recommend handwritten signs is when you're selling and you want to look like a motivated seller. Yes, selling is fine. Fine, no. And so, and I've gone to a few workshops where someone says, well, I just took so and class. They said this. I said, look, I've done 2,000 houses. I've been doing 25 years. You know, they've been in the business two years. You do whatever you want to do. I'm telling you, when I see that sign, that screams to me, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I'm so new, in fact, I don't even know how to make a sign. Don't do it. Get signs that look like these. These are nice, professional, clean signs. And I think everyone calls them bandit signs because the very first guy that came out with these signs for us real estate investors, his company was called banditsigns.com. And all of us are investing. Anyone that's ever been to any kind of a three-day thing or had a booth or anybody that's done anything in the last 30 years has uh, met David. So just banditsigns.com. They have all kinds of signs, and I like signs that are just like the one there, avoid foreclosure or behind in payments. Really basic, like, you know, behind in foreclosure, giant phone number. Do not get a sign that says, yeah, we buy any houses in any condition on the north side of town. It can be a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom. It can do this. We don't care. And then the phone number is like a quarter-inch tall. People that are driving by need to be able to see the phone number super clear. And if you get a website, it's got to be really simple, simple, simple. Not like, yeah, Bill and Tuan and Dustin buy houses on the north side of town.com. Nobody can read that. <laughs> so you got to just, and I know it sounds like so basic, but you can't believe how many people make the dumbest looking signs you've ever seen. And Bill and I do have the uh, great pleasure of traveling all the time. And anytime, so when we come to Atlanta, for example, anytime that we travel and we see a sign that's on a pole or a sign that has 15 lines of text on it and a, a minuscule phone number, we call them. And I'm like, hey, what you know, my name's Dwan. And they'll be like, who? And I'm like, excuse me, how do you not know? I'm Dwan and Twiper. I'm the queen of everything foreclosures. How do you not know me? But then after we get past that, I say, listen, I don't know what your deal is with your signs, if you're trying to make money or not, but let me tell you why your sign's terrible. And I can't tell you how, <laughs> how many people I've called and tell them how bad their sign is and tell them what they need to do. And then they're always like, who is this? I said, I told you. I said, I'm the sign police. If you're going to put a sign out, get a better sign. So I actually get a super huge kick out of calling people and, <laughs> and telling them if they have a great sign or they have a crappy sign. So do something nice. Just look professional, okay? I don't like people that say, oh, you don't want to seem like you're an investor out to make money. You are trying to make money. You are an investor, and they need to know you're a professional because they're losing their house. It's their biggest asset they're ever going to have in their whole life. Nobody wants to work with a newbie. And if you're a newbie, nobody knows you're a newbie but you. So putting up a crappy sign shows everyone that you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so I'm stepping off that soapbox now. So <laughs> you will probably hear me vent about this a little bit over the weekend because when I see people spend all this money and hundreds of dollars for their signs, I just want to scream at them. It's like, oh, for the love of God, did you not think about this sign? So, okay, off that soapbox. Let me go on. Let me just tell you how I started. Those of you that don't know me, um, there's my daughter. Oh, there she is all grown up. So I was a single mom. I had actually been fired from Denny's of all places. I was going through a divorce, had an eight-month-old baby, and I had what some people would call a come-to-Jesus moment. And I really had to make a decision, like, am I going to work? 
am I going to raise my daughter? Her dad's completely 100% out of the picture. And it was, uh, it was really tough. She was eight months old and it was not in my game plan at all to have a, a child and be single. And, you know, it just, it like messed everything up. So I really just sat down and did some soul searching. I thought, you know, the thing I want more than anything in the world, is I want to raise her myself. I don't want to go through daycare. So the why, everyone has to have a why. Like, why do you want to do this? So my why was I want to raise my child. I don't want to raise in daycare. I didn't wait till I was 30 to have kids. I could toss in the daycare system. I'm not doing that. I'm going to figure out a way to work from home. I don't care what I have to do. As long as it's legal, that child's going every place I go 24 hours a day. So as luck would have it, I met some investors. They were rehabbing houses. They told me, drive to the courthouse and write down all the, because you got to remember, guys, I'm talking 25 years ago. We didn't have GPS. We didn't have the internet. We didn't, no courthouse in the world was online. You had to physically get in your car, drive to the courthouse, write things down, and then you had to use those piece of crap map books, those neighborhood map books. Oh, my Lord, I thought I was going to lose my mind. When GPS came out, I was just like, Thank you, Lord. This is the best invention in the world because I hated trying to map out houses. It's just not my thing. Anyway, so I found a deal. I moved in it. I rehabbed it, put that baby on the market. I made $22,000. And I just thought like, oh my gosh, I've never in my life seen $22,000 and I have it in the bank. It's mine. Like, oh my gosh. And Ada was with me every day. Ah, I was out of my mind with excitement. So I said, this is it. I'm doing real estate. Jumped in, did another deal. So until Ayla started kindergarten, I would move in the house, rehab the house, sell it, move, sell it, and staying around the Palm Beach area, you know, because that's where my family and friends were and stuff. And um, I nailed it. You know, God just really helped me and I nailed it. And, and we had been able to work together and she never did a day in daycare and I got to be the homeroom mom and do all that super fun stuff. And then, you know, now you're getting better. People are asking you what you're doing. One thing leads to another. I opened up my own RIA in Florida. And then I started contacting banks. I was, I was flipping houses, flipping contracts. And I started calling the banks as the deals were starting to get tight. I was getting ready to go through my first rough period. And I asked the bank about doing short sales. And they're like, well, and they called them like discounting, discounting notes, selling it short. It was not really a coined term, so I trademarked the term short sales, and in the real estate arena, I have, I coined and trademarked the word short sale, and I still have it to this day, and again, in the real estate market, because it's a term that's used in the stock market, and it's used in a couple different markets, but I was able to coin it and term it and trademark it, and then I started teaching like full on in 1999, and I loved teaching. So now I'm teaching, I'm doing deals, I've got Ayla, she's traveling around with me, we're going to Rio groups, life is like, I can't imagine that this is my amazing Hollywood lifestyle I've got. And then a publishing company calls up and says, hey, I want you to write a book, so short sale pre-foreclosure investing, get it on Amazon. Then they said, hey, I want you to write another book, that book sold so well, let's make another one, but I want you to write a book that'll help out the homeowners. So I wrote How to Sell Your House When It's Worth Less Than the Mortgage, and that was for the homeowners. And then a couple years ago, they were doing interviews, and everyone had to submit articles and pictures and a story to be in a book with Steve Forbes. And I got chosen to write the real estate section of the Steve Forbes book, Success Onomics. So I have the lucky chapter 13. So grab that book, read chapter 13. It's amazing. And then that's me at my book signing with my man, Steve. And I was just really so excited. And I was like, why did you pick me? He said, well, what you wrote was good and fresh and new. And then he said I was super beautiful. And then in my mind, I was like, mm, but you're like so old. So <laughs> don't even think about going there with me. But anyway. So I got to write a book with Steve Forbes, which was unbelievably amazing. All right, so you now you know all the stuff about me, how I got started, what kind of signs I like. Let's talk about you. How are you going to find and flip a house for $30,000?
Now that's my minimum. Every house that you wholesale, every contract that you flip, everything that you do, I want you to crack $30,000 on each one of your deals. Everybody can do it. I'm going to teach you how this weekend because we are going to talk a little bit about flipping, a little bit about short sales. We're going to talk about some owner financing, some wraparound mortgages. We're going to talk about a lot, a lot, a lot of things. But tonight is we're going to, we're talking about flipping contracts. And that's the easiest, best way to start because you don't need money, a real estate license, nothing. You just boom and you just get someone to teach you how to do it. And that's what I'm here. And that's what Dustin's here for. That's why you have people like me. We're here to teach you how to do what we've already been doing for years and years and years. So you already know there's 20 million homes in some stage of default. You already know 1.4 million people are going to fall bankruptcy. You already know, or what you don't know, as I'm telling you right now, there's over 1 million bank owned. These are houses sitting there boarded up. There's over a million houses just boarded up. It's insane. That's a million places for you to put signs in the yards. Okay, so you're gonna define, you're gonna find your distressed seller. I just told you how, my favorite way, put those signs in the yards. We got 200 phone calls off 13 signs. How many people do you need to talk to to get a deal? Okay, and then you're gonna build a buyer's list. I will talk about this this weekend. I'll talk to you about how to find rehabbers, how to find landlords how to find people to sell houses to. So all you have to do is find a person losing their house from the bankruptcy or the foreclosure files, which are online, or from your signs, which people will call you, and put them together with the buyer. And you're gonna make more money than you ever even thought that you could imagine making. And I'm gonna help you and guide you to your success. So that is, that is my goal in life is to make as many millionaires as I can make before I die. So the more people I teach like you, the more homeowners that you help, and the more people that you teach, and the more people that they help, and just by the multiplication, what I could do by myself is maybe help 50 or 100 people a year, but with all of you, we can help hundreds of thousands of people a year. So it makes perfect sense to me. So, are you ready to rock? All right, so let's just say you found a homeowner and they called you up and they're so excited and they want to work with you. They love you, they want to work with you, they think you're great. You followed all my instructions and you built a really great buyers list and you have people with cash that want to buy right this very second and you're like, oh my gosh, Dwan is a rock star. I'm going to make my first $30,000. I can't believe it. And you're so excited. So just to double check that all the numbers are good, you call the bank to find out exactly what the homeowners owe. And you find out that they owe what their house is worth. So this contract that you thought was flippable, you're going to make all this money. You're going to make 30 grand. You find out they have a $200,000 house and they owe $200,000. You're like, oh man, my whole deal's going to fall apart. Well, is it? Is it? Is it really going to fall apart? No. And do you know why it's not going to fall apart? Because you have me. This is my three step short sale process. I'm putting them all three up here so you can write this all down. The banks have over a million houses that are sitting there right now already vacant and boarded up. They cannot afford to have any more houses. So you can now contact the bank directly and you can say, hey, I found this house. The homeowner wants to work with me. I know you don't want any more houses on your books. I'll buy this house. I can only buy it if the price is right because I'm not in the business of losing money, and that, which the bank goes, we're not either. And so I make three offers. Now you're thinking, well, Juan, why do you make three offers? Why do you have to do that? Well, think about it. I'm going to go into a negotiating process with my homeowner. So if I know I have to negotiate, you don't lay your best offer on the table first. I mean, negotiating 101 is save your best offer till the end. You, a, a negotiation is two people compromising to the point of, both of them being happy, not one person winning and one person losing. That's called being a bully. 
So we negotiate to where everybody's happy. So I make an offer. It's real low, real, real, real low. And like 20 or 30 or 40 percent of the value. And I talk about the homeowners and their distress and how awful this is. And then I, the bank counters me. So I make a second offer and I talk about the area and the neighborhood and how it's out of control and all these horrible things are going on. And oh my gosh, you don't want to get stuck with another houses. Do you want to have a million and one houses on your market, on your books? No, you don't. And then I go to the third offer and I hit the bank where they really care about is how much money are they actually going to lose? And I know this, I'm talking to many CEOs of banks, the very day that the bank files the foreclosure paper, the day they file the notice, you might call it a notice of default. Um, it's just called so many things in different states. So when the day the bank files the paper at the courthouse, and they begin the foreclosure process to take that house away from that homeowner, they already lose 40% of the value of the house before they even start. So think about that. They lose 40% of the house, the value, before they even start. So for me to come in and offer 50%, I'm not really out of line. They're only gonna, they lost 40% already. I'm just asking for 10% less than what they're, they've already lost. And I have a really great three-step process to make it make sense for the bank so that when they take my offer, they're thanking me and they're happy about it. Instead of them being like, oh, I can't believe you stole the house of months. Because we're not stealing houses from the bank. We're helping homeowners in distress get a fresh start. All right, so here's another thing the bank does not want you to know. Okay, so when you find a property, the bank is going to ask you for a listing agreement. So this is where you have to have your investor-friendly real estate agent, and you find them at your RIA. So you go to Dustin's RIA, you talk to the people in there that are real estate agents, you will find what is called an investor-friendly agent. An investor-friendly agent you put the short sale package together and they'll say, okay, I'll submit this for you. Now, here's the really cool thing. And that we lost this. This went away during the recession. You had to go to the banks and you had to go through the equator system. And it was, it was a horrible thing. So now the agent can say, oh, Mr. Banker, Dwan is my negotiator. So the bank actually lets you negotiate your own deal because you go through the, um, you sign the contract with your company name as the person who's buying and then the agent says, Juan's our negotiator. Now the bank will let you negotiate your own deal and they'll pay you. They pay negotiation fees. And this was something again, back in the recession, we didn't have this. The banks wouldn't pay you. They wouldn't talk to you. You had to go on their system. You had to do all their paperwork. You had to submit everything. You got a random agent every single solitary time you called, and it was maddening. But now it's not like that. Now your agent submits it. It says Dwan's a negotiator. Dustin's a negotiator. They say fine. You get on the phone, and you say my fee to negotiate $5,000, and they go great. So now they pay you to negotiate your own deal. I know you're thinking like, girl, that can't be. I am telling you, as God is my witness, it is so true. So another thing the bank doesn't like people to know is they pay the negotiation fee. Uh, you can make anywhere from $3,500 up to $10,000 to negotiate your own fee. So I always start off at ten. Well, my, my fee is $10,000 to negotiate the short sale. And they'll be like, no, we can't pay that. And usually, if you haggle around, you can end up with about five. But hey, it's 5000 bucks to negotiate your own deal. I mean, that's insane. And you can control your deal from the beginning to the end. And there's no way, if you put in a short sale, the bankrupt would say, hey, by the way, tell your agent they can pick their own negotiator. Hey, we'll pay the negotiator. 5000 Oh, the guy that's trying to buy the house as a negotiator? Cool, we'll take all that. The banks will never, never, never tell you this 
I know this because I know everybody in the banking industry, and I know people that are at the very super high top of the food chain, and they tell Bill and I what's going on. So you have so much power that you don't know that you have. Okay, now wait, it's going to get better. Listen to this. That the other thing, the fifth thing, the banks now are required to pay the homeowners a relocation fee. So whatever your used to be, whatever our check was going to be, we had to give the homeowners, you know, two or three or five or six thousand dollars to move. And now we don't have to do that anymore. The bank will pay the homeowners a relocation fee. So now you're getting paid to do your own deal. The bank's paying your homeowners to move out. That's money in your pocket. You're controlling your deal. And you're like, oh my gosh, I've got a great buyer. They're standing by. They've got cash. I'm going to be able to flip this contract. This is going to be the greatest thing in the whole world. So just kind of think about, and I know I'm going through this fast, and I know I'm talking fast, and that's what I do when I get excited. You can go back and listen to this again if you, if, because I can't talk slow. It's not possible. So I just want you to think about for a second all the things I just said to you here. So in the past, like let's just even say five years ago, if I had a check and I was making $30,000, I would have to give the homeowners maybe 5,000 bucks to relocate and then I would be making 25. Now listen, I'm happy to make $25,000. Don't get me wrong. I'm thrilled to make $25,000. But now the bank's gonna give me $5,000 to negotiate. The bank's gonna give my homeowners $5,000 to move and that $30,000 is all going in my pocket, plus my $5,000 to negotiate, plus I didn't have to pay the homeowner. I actually just made $40,000 on my $30,000 deal, and I didn't have to spend money for anything. So, like, think about that. And there's no way the banks will tell you this. They don't want you to know this kind of stuff. This is stuff that you know because you know people and you ask questions and you're doing deals like we are actively doing deals and you start finding these things out and then you get on a, a webinar like this and you're like, well, I've never heard this stuff before. That's because most people don't know it because they're not involved. They're not, you know, like, like, like Dustin's a great group leader because he does deals. I'm a great group leader with our group in Denver because I do deals. What I can't stand is trainers, teachers, gurus, group leaders who haven't done a deal in 20 years now they want to teach you how to do it. They're not in the real estate business. They're in the seminar business. You want to work with people that are in the real estate business, and that's why you want to come and see me this weekend, because we are in the real estate teaching and training and education business. So, I mean, isn't this like fantastic information? There's so much money you all are walking away from. Oh, my gosh. It just breaks my heart how the banks are giving it away and how so many are walking away from it because they don't know to ask the right questions. That's all it is. It's a matter of asking the right questions. So I just want you to look at a couple people real quick. Here's my man, Jim. I love this guy so much. He's closed over 800 deals since he started working with us. Look at Cesario. He did uh, 8,000, 10,000, 10,000. I said, dude, up your game. You're making $10,000 a deal. What's wrong with you? Make more money. You're not, do something better. Negotiate harder. Do something. Next deal, boom, out of the ballpark, $52,000. Very excited. And I give pep talks too, to you guys when you're having, doing deals. I'm always like, ah, do this and this and this and this. Uh, uh, Mary and Paul, they paid up all their credit cards on their very first wholesale. They flipped a contract. Their very first deal, they made $37,000 and paid up all their credit cards in one shot. It was unbelievable. And then my guy, Michael, this is the best story ever. He, he went high, man. He went for a $600,000 house. And where you live, that might not be a lot. But at that time, I was living down in South Florida, and I was working in the hood. So I was buying thirty-five dollars and $40,000 houses. <laughs> so this guy, like, went for it. He went for a $600,000 house, and they owe six hundred. dollars And the bank said, look, we'll take half, but you have to close by the last day of the month. It was December 30th. So now he's like, Juan, what do I do? Like, really seriously, what do I do? The bank's going to take this crazy offer. I don't know what to do. I've never wholesaled. I've never flipped. I've never rehabbed. I've never done anything. I said, honey, wholesale that house. 
So that's his first check right there. He made $137,000, 39 and $39 and 35 cents. You're like, oh, he was like out of his mind. And I know when you look at the check, the check says 25,000. That was the deposit he got from the buyer, the $25,000 deposit. And then when it was all said and done, he netted 137. So I think we could all use a check like that. I don't know. I feel like if you come see me this weekend, I can show you how to do that. And then look at Louisa, 7,600, 15,000, 43,000, 22,9, 47. She made 292,000. She called me up and said, I found a piece of vacant property. It's commercial. Can you, can you wholesale and flip a contract on commercial property? I said, well, of course you can. So she made $292,000. I mean, that's insane. And then I also sometimes coach people and help them through their deals. And these are the last three deals I just did with my last three students. Tancredi made $89,000. Uh, Brendan and Jimmy made $58,000. Austin and his wife made twenty-five. dollars So we have stuff just like boom, boom, boom. We're doing deals all over the place, other cities, other states, working with people, helping people. I mean, it's unbelievable. And so if you at all heard one little tiny nugget that you would like to learn or hear or see, you have to come this weekend. We have, so in a two-day workshop, you have eight hour and a half slots. So you hour and a half, everybody goes to pee, hour and a half, we go to lunch, hour and a half, we go to the bathroom, hour and a half, it's the end of the day. So we're covering eight different topics. And this one, I just showed you guys like gold. And we're gonna cover eight different topics and they're all different. So you'll get a very wide variety of things real estate related. Okay, we're gonna do everything in our power to help you make today cash. I only care about you making today cash. And I, you know, we're happy to show you how to do long-term investing and things like that. But right now, everybody needs cash right now, okay? We all do, all right? We're gonna teach you things that no other trainer teaches, and we inv uh, actively do actually invest in real estate. And I want you to register right this very second. And I hope I got this right, Dustin. It's summit.atlantaria.com. So I'm hoping I read that right off of the text message. So that's where you need to go, and you need to register for this weekend. The seating is always limited because we rent the space. It holds this many seats, and when they're all full, they're all full. And Dustin, I think you said it was like 29 for gold, 49 for something. Where's Dustin? Dustin, are you with me still, baby? I'm here. So I don't remember the prices that you said. I'm pulling it up again. It is 29 for gold members, 49 for silver members, 99 for non-members. Also, if you are a member of any of our REA groups that I mentioned, Atlanta REA, Tampa REA, Savannah REA, Chattanooga REA, Charlotte REA, it's a two-for-one special. So you can bring you and your significant other, you and your uh, parent, or you and your adult child. Nice. I think so. You know, it's funny on the Zoom, I can see all these questions are popping up. It's like, and just boom, boom, boom. There are so many questions. <laughs> I noticed. So I will answer questions until you feel like you're done answering questions. So you ready? I am ready. All right. Give me a second here to pull them up. All right, we got like 37 that came in. I, I answered a few of them myself. Some of them were kind of, you know, some of them were redundant where they were asking the same questions. I answered yeah, a few. That always happens. So we're going to start from the top. The first question that came in said, I'm, a strug I'm struggling with poor credit issues, but taking the steps to fix them. Is there a way to still do deals with poor credit? Ah, oh, that's such a great question. The great thing about wholesaling or flipping, whatever you want to call it, I think right now the hot term is learning how to flip contracts. 
Flipping contracts, flipping houses, and wholesaling is all the same thing. You are getting the house under contract, and then you're selling the house to a rehabber or a landlord or somebody else with the money. So you never actually own the property, so you don't need a real estate license, no money, and no credit. So I would suggest you wholesale a couple of houses, get some money, get some of your bills paid down, and then maybe work with a credit repair company to repair your credit just for your own personal, you know, just because you want it repaired, but you absolutely positively don't need any credit. Trust me, honey, I went through a divorce with an eight-month-old child. I lost my house in foreclosures. My credit cards got written off. I had, I mean, I had such bad credit. I don't think I could have qualified to buy a pack of gum. And uh, I became a millionaire, so even with a bad credit. So I wouldn't worry about it. All right. This next question came in through the chat interface as I was just sitting here chatting with you folks. And uh, Karen said, will the summit be recorded? And can we purchase the recording? I'm in Florida. Uh, well, my answer is no. I don't know how you run your RIA, but I do not uh, like the summits to be recorded and I don't sell them. If you would like to come to one, there are other ones, and you know what? It, traveling is probably one of the best things that you could do because when you get away from your house, your kids, your daily life, you learn more. People that come to a workshop and they go home that night, maybe they get a fight with their spouse, now they're in a bad mood the next day, sometimes they don't come back. So you're better off to go somewhere and, uh, or, or come to a different one that Dustin does. He does them all over the place. Yep. So um, my answer to her was, uh, I don't have you on the schedule for Tampa yet, but it is in our plans for the very near future, just so you know. I'm down on Tampa as long as we wait till after August. <laughs> it's fine with me, whenever you're I ready. I want to come down there now. I want to go to the outside patio place with the music and the good food and not like die from the heat. <laughs> You're going to die from the as hot as heck down there right now. Uh, Emily wrote in and asked, will you be coming to Chattanooga soon? Emily, I'll answer that one. Not soon, but Chattanooga is only about 90 minutes away from Atlanta. Get down here for this two-day event for sure. Yeah, I have family that lives in Chattanooga, and uh, my favorite cousin lives in Atlanta. So I don't even want to hear people talk about that. That is such a nice, beautiful, short drive. You know, Signal mound. I mean, like, don't, I just get your butt down there. All right. This question's from Robin. Where do you get the paperwork, such as an assignment for buyers? And that that question came in very early on in the webinar. Well, the really cool thing about that is I have all the paperwork that you ever need. Now, and yes, it is for sale. And so I'm not trying to sell you paperwork. You can call an attorney. You can have them make you an assignment but they charge like four grand, three or $4,000 to make an assignment of contract. Um, you can check with your title company or your attorney that closes your deals. You can ask them if they have one that they'll give you or sell you. Or you can come to my workshop this weekend and be like, oh, Dawn, you're so great. I want to work with you. And I'll go, hey, here's my program. And guess what? You get an assignment and a land trust. Yeah, I'm going to ditto that answer. Um, if you get it from an attorney, it's going to be boilerplate Ugh. and not necessarily geared to what we do. Yeah. What I recommend is what Dewan said, team up with whomever your mentor is going to be. They will usually provide you with all that paperwork. Dewan and Bill are certainly no exception. And then have your attorney review it before you use it. And that is exactly why I had one made and written specifically for real estate investors, because, you know, when I was brand, brand, brand new, I didn't know about stuff like that either. So I talked to my title company, like, where do I get one of these assignments? And um, so they said, well, we have one here. We have an attorney on staff. And they handed me this thing. I read it and read it and read it. And I was like, I just can't be that stupid. I don't understand this. <laughs> and I mean, I don't understand why I can't understand this document. So I went to an attorney and I said, listen, can you make me a brand spanking new one that uses like regular words and has the legal stuff in where it needs it and people can understand it 
especially me, if you make me an assignment that I can use for years to come, and I have the best assignment. It's so great. And I've used it thousands of times. I think you're going to like this next question it's from Stephen. He wrote in early on in the webinar. He said, my wife and I are looking into the Denver market since we want to move out there. We currently live in Georgia. Who do you recommend targeting to get started out there? Absentee owners, pre-foreclosures, et cetera. Well, that's a great question. A, join the Colorado RIA because that's my RIA group. So then uh, you get to see me every month and learn and learn things from me. Um, as far as the markets, I mean, I got to tell you what, Denver is, it's the craziest market. It's so on fire. And then there's other little pockets where it's struggling so bad, you know. But right now, people are having a problem with um, the rents are increasing because of all the people moving in and people can't afford to buy a house and people are losing houses and just all this crazy stuff. So I would, again, I would target like the foreclosures, all the people that are in foreclosure. And I would target some of the level three areas like Lakewood and Littleton and Aurora and some of the places like that. Those are areas around Denver that are really super hot. All right, Jasmina wrote in with a comment. She just said, glad you're here. Um, oh, thanks. I'm glad you're really here. Really enjoying it. She says, thank you. She's really excited. So, Jasmina, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Please get involved with one of your local REIA groups. We'd love to have you. And, you know, I just want to throw something in, if I could. Um, and, I, and I in no in way am trying to bash RIA groups at all, but I've been speaking for 25 years, and I have been speaking at RIA groups this whole time. Every, I, I don't even think there's a RIA group in the country I've not spoken for. If you're going to go to a RIA group, before you go and just join, go to the group a couple times and try to determine, is the RIA group leader trying to help educate you, or are they looking for people to be their bird dogs? If you have a leader that's straight up looking for bird dogs, you're never going to learn anything there. And, and like Dustin, he's always got people coming in. He's always training. He's got something almost every single day of the week that's education-based. And you can join the wrong RIA and literally go out of business. Yeah, for sure. All RIA groups are not created alike. Get out there, check them out, see which one's the best fit for you for sure. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right, this next question is from Mike. He said, I'm beginning my wholesale career in Charlotte with no deals under my belt. How and when is the best way to physically present a contract to a seller? Well, that is a great question, too. When you are sitting down talking to the homeowner and they say, yeah, I'm, you know, I definitely need to do something, it's your job. To, to close that deal. Like, hey, are you ready to go to contract? You ready to get the ball rolling? You ready to get out of your situation? You ready to start having a good life again? I've got paperwork with me. I've got contracts with me. Let's sign it right here at the kitchen table. Like, there's the best time is the second that they say, yeah, I need out of my situation. That's it. Get them to sign the contract. We've signed contracts with people at Wendy's, at Denny's, at my title company, at my own office, at my house at their house, everything. The only thing you never want to do, and I'm going to really say, this is a heed my warning comment, never ever have the homeowners notarize anything at their house where you brought a notary with you. Because that just screams like you're a skank and also that you're doing something that's uh, maybe not right. And if anything ever came back, it would come back on you. So if you want to notarize a power of attorney, as you get going further, you'll understand. You want to notarize a homeowner's document. You want to notarize even an assignment. If you want to notarize anything, you go to a bank or you go someplace and you have to bit notarize someplace else. Never at the person's house, never at your office, never any place where it could appear that you pressured them. But as far as signing a contract, no notary needed there. If they, The second they even give me a whip that they're ready to go, I'm like, well, all right, let's get the contract signed. Let's get going. Come on, time's a-wasting. That's right. So just make sure you're, you're dealing with motivated sellers. Uh -huh. And 
you'll get some contracts under your belt pretty quick. Everywhere you go, in your car, from this day forward, you should have a little briefcase that's got a sign, that's got contracts, copies, multiple copies of contracts. You should have a blue pen so you have an original signature, and you should have bandit signs so every time you see a vacant house, you can just whip off the road, stick that sign in the yard, and you should always have contracts, assignments, pens, calculators. You should have a little tiny office everywhere you go because you literally don't know, you don't know where you're going to find or sign a deal. Yep, and if you're a little bit higher tech than Dwan, you can have your tablet with you, such as an iPad or a Surface, and do it right there on the spot without having to even have paper. That you can. Now, I'm sorry, I like to sign contracts. I'm still old school that way. I know, I'm just teasing you. I I'm do. old school too. I still like papers myself. Uh, you know, I'm probably the only investor in the country that doesn't like do everything on their pad. But I don't know. I feel like for the homeowner, because they're not all in their 20s and 30s. There's so many of them that are older. I feel mm -hmm. like when they have a contract in their hand and they're reading it, they're touching it, and they get to keep it, it's more like, oh, yeah, okay, this feels real to me. So, but I don't know. I still read the newspaper, so who am I to talk? <laughs> You're one of the few. All right, this Hi. next question is from Galaxy S8 Plus. They said, good evening, guys. I was just wondering how to find a title company and one that is investor friendly, even though I'm not sure what that really means. All right, so, uh, so title companies, so again, I just want to just reiterate this one point. Based on the state that you live in, you use either a title company, an escrow company, or you use an attorney. Different states require different things. In Colorado, we use title companies. California, they use escrow companies. I think in New York and New Jersey, you have to have an attorney. So it's the same thing. It is the person that closes your transactions for you. Okay, so the person that closes your transactions for you is the title company. And investor friendly would simply mean that they specialize in working with investors opposed to end buyers like when a family and they buy a house and and then and their dog and their puppies are moving into a house that is like a retail title company and they're not creative like we are they don't think like we do so you need that investor friendly one that says oh you want to wholesale you want to flip something you want to do a double closing that's what we specify. That's what we specialize in. And honestly, the best place to, for those people is to go to your local RIA leader and say, who are you personally using to close your deals? And then you know that they're investor friendly. So investor yep. friendly just means they do creative stuff, nothing against the law, nothing illegal, nothing even in the gray area. They just have a creative mindset. Yep. And that's good advice. And if you're local RIA leader doesn't actually do deals because some of them don't ask some of the active members in that group because anybody that's in a RIA group should be able to tell you who the local investor friendly title companies or closing attorneys are yes all right this next question is a two-part question from Kevin he said what would you do if you just got fired from a job have some good savings like 75,000 and wanted to start a real estate business. He said, I'm gun shy about using the banks and my credit rating is very, very poor. A, if you just got fired, you are the luckiest man because you have 40 hours a week to invest in real estate. 40 hours a week. You could be out there knocking on doors, talking to people, doing deals. I mean, that's the best thing that ever happened to you, dude. If you have $75,000, you honestly need to get yourself a, a good mentor, which would be me, and have someone guide you and help you and teach you who's not going to charge you your whole $75,000 because that's ridiculous. And you need someone to kind of help. You need to join a RIA group, and you need to get out there, and you need to get hustling because you've got – 40 extra hours that you can invest in doing nothing but real estate. You've got a little bit of savings to pay bills for whatever you have, four, five, six months worth of bills right there. And if you don't jump in head first, 
you're going to you're going to miss the greatest opportunity of your life yeah, some good advice. And Kevin, uh, hold on to that 75K tightly. Don't go out there and blow it on a deal as a newbie and lose it all. No. Invest as if you were broke. And for the love of God, do not go to one of these drive-by seminars where someone from TV is coming in town for a free preview. There'll be at five hotels in the next five days. I swear if you do that, I will come through this computer and kill you myself. They will get 50000 bucks out of your pocket, and you will learn nothing. So other than Dustin's workshops, stay away. Don't go to stuff that seems too good to be true. Invest just like you're broke, like he said. Every deal we do, we just give the homeowners a $10 deposit. No one ever says no. You just see $10 and a little bit of oomph, and you can get out there and make it happen. That is totally true. Kevin, again, as a new investor, hold on to that money tightly. Do not let it burn a hole in your pocket. Do not go out there and blow it. Do not go out there and invest it in some risky deal. No. Flip hold some on contract. To it, get out there and get trained. And uh, we can teach you this business and how you can hold on to that money and quadruple it. But if you just quit your job or got fired, you're going to need to live off that money for a little bit as you get started. So hold on to it for sure. That's right. All right, this next question uh, is from Galen. He might have came in a few minutes late and didn't hear this answer, but I'll go ahead and ask it for his benefit because several other people asked something similar. What is the purpose of a bandit sign? Others ask, what is a bandit sign? <laughs> okay, so there's just those signs that you see up to say, I buy houses cash. And again, I, I call them bandit signs. I think most investors do. Just because the guy that started the company, bandasigns.com, he started way back in the day when all of us were new, 25 years ago, making these signs. And he has basically geared his entire business towards making signs for real estate investors. So we buy the large, so just go to bandasigns.com. We go, we, we get the large signs, there's two sizes, get the large signs. We get the ones that are yellow and black because it has been proven that they do stand out more. We don't hand write them and hand make them and buy a piece of poster board that's going to crumble at the first drop of rain. And the purpose of them is to put them in the yards so that people driving to and fro will see the sign and go, well, that house says we buy houses cash or it says facing foreclosure, question mark. I'm in foreclosure or it says unwanted property with a giant phone number. And what will happen is people will see the signs and they'll call you because they need help or they're gonna need help or they're already in trouble. And they'll call you off your sign to see what you can do to help them. So it is the quickest, fastest possible way to advertise your business because you can have signs on your doorstep in four days and you can have 50 signs out in seven days and you could be getting hundreds of phone calls from people that need help. That's right. All right. I just want to make this little announcement. We have over 54 open questions. So the two of us have to start kind of going through these a little bit faster if we're going to get out of here tonight. You ready? Yep. All right. This is from Clarissa. Can someone tell me how to know if a house is truly vacant? since some of them are ugly and people close the blinds up and I just can't tell. Go up and look in the window and knock on the door. I'm, <laughs> I've looked in the window many times thinking it was abandoned only to have some eyes staring out back at me. I have to. <laughs> Another have to. easy way, and this is still not foolproof, is to check the meter and see if, it, if the meter's running or if it even has a meter. If there's no meter running or it doesn't have a meter, it's, it's probably vacant, but there could be homeless people living in it, so be careful. I actually, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I have to say this. Me and my partner, way back in the day, we found this house, and it definitely was vacant, and it was locked up, I mean, just like Fort Knox, and there was a little side window on the side, but I couldn't get through the window, and Sharon was like half my size. So I kind of hoist her up there. She, you know, like climbs in the window, you know, rolls into the house and stands up. 
and there's a squatter living in the house that's in the house. And he stands up, and he sees her, and she unlocks the front door for me, and she screams, and I scream, and he screams, and the guy starts running down the alley, and I don't know why, but we chased this guy for like five blocks. <laughs> it happens. What are we doing? He doesn't even live there. It happens all the time. Oh, my God. It was so funny. So be careful. But if there's no meter, you can assume it's vacant, but it does not mean there's not somebody staying there. So be careful. All right. This next question is from Brandy. She's new and said, how did you get financing for your very first deal when you were new? Well, again, um, like I said, I didn't have it. Well, I don't know if I said it or not. I had no money back then whatsoever. So the deal I made with this homeowner was that she would move out and I was going to move in. So I couldn't afford an apartment and living and paying a mortgage. And, you know, I couldn't get financing. I didn't even know that stuff existed. So this lady, Barbara, moved out. I moved in. I rehabbed it really quickly. And we got it sold and got it on the market before it ever came up to the foreclosure sale. And I moved in and out of houses like that for the first four or five years. And then I discovered hard money, and I started using hard money lenders to fund my rehabs. Can you repeat that last part real quick? I started using hard money lenders. Hard money lenders. Now, yeah, have they changed since you used them way back when? You know, I find the hard money lenders that we have that belong to my RIA group, they charge a higher percentage for sure. And they're not all willing to just give you, like, here's 100% plus the rehab money plus everything. But if they see you close a deal or two, they're very generous. Yes, that was a qualification if you close a deal or two. So a lot of these folks out there are brand new and don't necessarily have cash or credit. It kind of goes to this next question. No, but uh, that's why you guys that don't have cash or credit, get off of the rehabbing bandwagon. Don't rehab a house. You need money to fix up a house. Wholesale. Wholesaling, it means getting on a contract, selling it to a rehabber or a landlord, and making the difference in between. I just right. talked about that for the last hour. So get off of the rehab bandwagon. Get off of the money, credit. You're all going down the wrong path. Get a house on the contract. Sell it to somebody else. Make twenty grand. Do that five or six times, and then you don't have to worry about money. Right, because if you're going to be rehabbing, you need some cash or some credit or a partner who has both. Uh, but this next question goes to what you were just talking about. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase. It's from Anonymous. Um, he or she said they were, uh, have been doing, working on a grant project for about five years. And the grant project overspent, so I guess they're getting let go. And they're getting ready to be um, out of a job. And they ask, what would be the best strategy to get into investing without having that income cushion? Well, the same thing. Just try to wholesale something. I mean, flipping contracts is so easy. You literally can just get your balls up and go knock on the door, get a homeowner that says, hey, I like you. I want to work with you. I'll sign a contract. Call a rehabber or call Dustin or call one of us and say, I got a house and I'm ready to sell it to a rehabber. Rehabber will take anything in any condition, anywhere, any neighborhood, as long as the numbers work, and sell it. You can close these deals. You can rehab. You can flip a house in less than 14 days. Done, sold, flipped, 25000 30 bucks in your pocket. And I'll tell you right now, um, at our RIA groups, we are looking for deals every single day. Uh -huh. We, I mean, because it's a seller's market, inventory is low. Uh, you know, many of our members are struggling to find deals to rehab. They've got the money, they just don't have the time or the marketing skills to get out and find these deals. They need people like yourself, wholesale wholesalers, bird dogs, etc., to go out there and find the deals <clears throat> and bring it to them. Exactly. Well, so listen to what, what I'm saying. Yeah, the thing about wholesaling, so just again, wholesaling, flipping, flipping contracts, it's all the same thing. It means you got the house under contract, you sold it to somebody else, you didn't own the property. The thing about wholesaling is when you become a good wholesaler and you bring really good deals to your 
rehabbers and your landlords, they'll stop looking for their own deals and they'll just wait and like, hey, Duan, what do you got coming up? They'll just become continuous buyers, house after house after house. And once they completely rely on you, now you've got people that they can't do their business without you. You've got guaranteed buyers right there in the queue all the time that'll take anything that you give them because you're going to give them good deals. Yep. And this next question, it, she's addressing that. This is from Cindy. She said, what do you, what would you recommend the best thing to do for wholesalers? What is an appropriate wholesale fee for different properties? That is something I want to do specifically first, then move into rehabs and flips. Thank you. Okay, very good question. Now, so this is like a two-part answer. A, many, many, many of the group leaders in the country will hire you and train you to be a bird dog, and they'll pay you $2,500 a deal. So when someone tells you, I'll give you $2,500 $3,000 for a deal, I'm telling you, no. N-O, you're not going to do that. You're going to go and find a house by yourself. You're going to flip it by yourself. And the you should make about anywhere from 10 to 20% of the retail value of the property. So if you're going to flip a $100,000 house, you should make 10, 15, 20,000. If you're going to flip a $200,000 house, you should make somewhere between 20 and 40. Never ever let somebody have you down to two or three or four thousand dollars because the minute they do that to that investor, you are now a two thousand dollar person and you can never charge more. But I do want to add this it's got to be a good deal to get those numbers. Oh, if, yeah, it's got to be a good deal. That goes without question. If it's a crummy little marginal deal, you may be lucky to get a couple grand out of it. And you know what? If it is a marginal deal, but it's, it's helping a homeowner to get a fresh start. The bank will give the homeowner some money. You can make 3000 bucks, and it's a great deal for a rehabber, but it's a really marginal. Just take it. But Absolutely. If you, if you get in the habit of letting rehabbers tell you, well, I'll give you 2000 bucks for every deal you bring. I mean, honestly, you do 100 deals a year at $2,000 a piece. You're not making very much money, and I'm telling you, you're doing a lot of work. Yep. So as a new investor, it's going to be very important for you to get trained, which is why you need to be at this workshop this weekend. As a wholesaler, these rehabbers are looking for accurate numbers. You've got to know your after repair value, uh -huh. what the house is worth fixed up, and you have to have a good grasp on what the repair costs will likely be so that you can run your Mayo formula figure out what you're going to offer the seller and leave enough room in the deal for the rehabber to make some money. You've got to be there this weekend to learn some of these skills if you don't already know them. Yeah. And you know, just to add on top of what you just said, if you take all the money out of the deal and you make more than the rehabber, they will stop using you. And whether you believe this or not, real estate investing is really a tight industry. Like everyone at your RIA knows everyone. Everyone at my RIA knows everyone. Everyone knows everyone. And then they'll say, man, don't buy houses from Juan. She made 30 grand and I barely made off with 10. And I rehabbed that house and took all the chance. And she took all the money off the table. Never let yourself get that reputation because I'm telling you, you won't make it. The bulk of the money has to go to the person taking the biggest risk, which is the rehabber and the landlord. Let them make way more than you do so they'll keep coming back. Yeah, because they're the ones paying all cash, not only for the house, but all that rehab money to put in. Into... Rehab, and who knows how long it's going to be on the market, and it yep. could get vandalized. I mean, they're taking all the risk. So you, you, you leave you, the bulk of the money on the table, but you take a fair amount for yourself. Yeah, come this week, and she'll teach you all about this, because you might can find someone to partner up with you on that deal and split the back end profit 50-50 or something like that. So come get some more information. I put the um, link up on the screen, summit.atlantaria.com. It's this weekend in Atlanta. So we're going to keep moving. This next question, you'll probably get a chuckle out of. Uh, this is from Clarissa. I'm a realtor interested in helping investors and getting started investing myself, but I'm unsure I need to go invest thousands and thousands of dollars for a, I'm going to leave this blank, 
who's coming to town. I'm trying to avoid that like the plague. Don't go. If someone is coming to town that's asking for thousands of dollars and they're what I call a drive-by and you know who I'm talking about, don't There's go. a bunch you're talking about. There's probably at least five I can think of off the yeah, top of my head that come through Atlanta every out. single I summer. Have, it's all the people that, I have an HGD TV show and I'm coming into town. They're just a bunch of salespeople. You know, I, I'm part of this, you know, builders and I'm part of the poor dad and I'm the guy from Vegas and I'm the guy from California and I'm going to show you how to make, and I'm Kevin Harrington and I'm going to show you how to make all this money. No, they're not. Folks, listen. Listen to me carefully. They are in the seminar business. They do not actively invest in real estate. You do not need to work with a person who's in the seminar business. Even though I'm coming as a seminar, I am a real estate investor who works in the real estate world. And Clarice is like, I'm laughing so hard at your answer. <laughs> Ah, but it's the God's truth. Please don't go do that stuff. Exactly. So get involved with your local REA group. Get trained. You don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars before you ever get started. Please. If you're making tens of thousands of dollars, you can go reinvest tens of thousands of dollars into your education. But don't do all that first. Go out there. Get, get trained a little bit. Go out there, get your first deal, make some money, and then reinvest in yourself. Yeah, Clarissa, see there she's writing again. She was the one that was laughing. So I'm yeah. laughing. It's true, though. And I know that sounds sad. I'm not picking on anybody, but I'm just telling you guys, you know, because I go to all kinds of stuff, Dustin. And everything that comes to town, I love to go to free previews. I want to see, like, how hard are they going to pressure me? How are they going to, you know, how are they going to make me buy? What do they have? And I go to stuff all the time. And I think if I ever pick up for everything, info marketing, for anything yeah. else. And I'm like, if I pick up a tidbit, it'll be great. But I will tell you something just real quick before we all part ways. Ayla and I went to one very recently. And the person that runs that runs all of these drive-by. He's the, he's the seminar guy. And that's his business. He runs every seminar that's going around the country. And I even talked to the guy that was the main speaker. He said, oh, yeah. So-and-so runs it, and this is what we do. And so Ayla and I, my daughter, were sitting there, and I said, listen, no matter what, we're not buying anything. It got down to the very end, and we were like the only two people that hadn't stood up. The guy from the front of the room, the presenter, actually walked over, took our hands, and said, come on, we have to have a mother-daughter team. And he walked us back into that big horseshoe and made us buy. That's how much pressure we got. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to buy it just because that guy didn't let me walk out of the room. We were the last two people holding out. <laughs> and he came and walked us up to the room. Been there, done that. Been there, oh, done that God, many times. So funny. I was dying laughing. Hey, I, I hate to tell you this, but we, have, we still have 57 questions. No, so we're we we're, we're going to do a mile a minute and see how many of these we can get through quickly. Uh, okay. This, this question, you should be able to answer this one quickly. It's from uh, Alanise. Where can we find information on people in bankruptcy? It's at, the, it's at the courthouse. Online, it's at the federal courthouse. Yep. So check with the federal courthouse if you want to uh, go do that yourself. And you can also, if you have an attorney friend, uh, get some more information for them about that. We can do all 57 questions in like 10 minutes if I can just give one answer questions. Let's do it. Okay, go. All right, from Anonymous, I'm feeling very intimidated about where and how to find money slash investors. Okay, I just said you don't need money. All you need is rehabbers and landlords. They're at the RIA group. They're on Craigslist, run ads, look on Facebook, uh, hashtag things. Find the people. You don't need any money. You've got the deals. They got the money. Bring them the deals. This is from Sharon. How do I put together a buyer's list? Oh, good question. First, uh, I actually put out ads on Craigslist. I'm looking for rehabbers. And people call me. I go through a questionnaire that I have asking them what they're looking for, what's their price range, what's their rehab level, how many houses a year do they want to do, do they have cash, 
Do they close quickly? Do they have to work with banks? I have a, a questionnaire, which I might go over a little bit of it this weekend. I have a questionnaire, and after they fill it all out, I say, okay, as soon as I get a house, I'll call you back. And then as I'm building my buyer's list, I stay in touch and call people, you know, once a week or so, let them know I'm working on some deals. And then once I get my first deals, I call my rehabbers. I have them go look at it. They buy it from me. I don't need any money. I make money. And then I see who rises to the top and yep. who actually steps up and buys and who just always says, no, next one, next one, next one. And after yep. you say next one three times, you're off my list. Yep. Go to your local RIA group. You'll quickly see who the buyers are. Get them on your list. They will buy everything you have if it's a good deal. Also, you know those yellow bandit signs DeWan was talking about? It says, we buy houses. Imagine that. They buy houses. Call them. Get them on your buyer's list. I have uh, bandit signs <clears throat> that say rehabbers needed. And I also have bandit signs. When I need people, I put out signs for it. I need yep. rehabbers. Yep. People call me and go, I'm a contractor. I'm like, good. I need you. I, I put signs out. Whatever I need, I just make a sign. I go put 20 signs out. And I, I find uh, I need landlords. If you're a landlord, call me. I have great deals. I, I put signs out for everything. <laughs> That's right. All right. This next one is from Fent. Do you have to get permission from the homeowner before you talk to the bank? I think he's talking about short sales. Do yeah. you have to? When you have the homeowner sign the contract, they will also sign a document called an authorization to release information. You have to have that signed and filled out by the homeowner, send it to the bank in order for them to legally give you that private information. This next question is from Sue Ellen. Is the relocation fee you were talking about the same as cash for keys? Yes. It's technically called a relocation fee. It is the exact same thing as cash for keys. Cash for keys, they tend to only want to give you $2,500, hold out for $5,000. All right, this next question is from Art. He said, do you put bandit signs on REO properties only or any vacant house? Not our, yet. Yeah. Well, if it has a real estate agent sign in the yard, no. Because then the house is listed and now the bank is involved with the property again. I put them in the yards of any vacant house that I find no matter where it's at. And if I see a commercial place that's gone out of business and there's grass, I put a sign there. All right, and uh, Art will be at the event this weekend. Art's one of your, your your customers. You will remember him when you see him. Good. He's the guy who always wears the goggles. Yes, I love Art. Ah, how you doing, bud? <laughs> he does always wear the goggles. That's how I know who he is. Yep, that's exactly right. That's how everybody knows who he is. All right, this is from Steven. Do you typically assign or double close on a short sale deal? Right now, I typically double close. I don't have time to go into the long, lengthy explanation this very moment. That's fine. If the, so I'm just going to say A, standard double close, but if your buyer is an actual rehabber and they have true cash, assign. All right, John asked how to develop buyer's list. We already answered that one. Uh, Nafet asked this question, and he's, they're talking about short sales again. Does the buyer have to purchase these deals with cash? No. You're going to double close. I will actually talk about that. You're going to double close. But on their end... I'm not going to use your cash. The person that's buying is, so, okay, at the risk of not making everyone so confused that they don't know what they're talking about, I'm going to try to give it like a two-sentence explanation, and I'm praying. <laughs> I don't go over everybody's head. When you have a deal that you're short selling, somebody has to close on it, and then the second person buys it. So we put the house into an LLC. So everyone knows like an LLC, a corporation. <laughs> It's a legal entity. We, put, we deed the house into the LLC. Then we sell the LLC to the rehabber or the landlord. So they're technically buying the company from me that owns the house. They're not actually buying the house. Therefore, we don't need to double close. All right. Mike Murphy wrote in, but his question is a little complicated. Mike, I know you're probably going to be there this weekend. 
save this question um, about negotiations with the bank for this weekend because it's a little complicated and uh, we're running out of time. But I do appreciate that question. It's a good one. All right. Let's see what else we got here. How do I structure a contract with contingency so I'm not stuck buying a house if I can't flip the contract in time? That's from Mike. Okay, every single property that I get, I buy as is with no contingencies. I don't leave a weasel clause in any of my contracts because if it's not a good enough deal, the only reason your house won't sell is, write this down. This is super important, super spy stuff. The only reason your house won't sell is it is priced too high. People will buy houses that look like they're falling into the ground. People will buy fire damage. People will buy houses where the roof has been ripped off and it's a piece of crap moldy ball. The only reason your house won't sell is it's priced too high. So I do not leave any contingencies. I buy everything as is. The homeowners count on me. I give them a $10 deposit. And if I don't close, I lose my $10. All right. Now, is that the same information or the same suggestion you would give these brand new investors? Yeah, because, I mean, if you want to get the house inspected, I mean, the thing is, even if you get the house inspected, there's going to be stuff wrong with it. So that's why it's important. Like you said this earlier, Dustin. It's important for people to learn what rehab, what, what it costs to rehab stuff. You know how to learn what how it costs to rehab stuff? Do what I did. Go to Home Depot. Walk in Home Depot and go back there to the little computer section and say, listen, I need a roof for 1,200 square foot house. I want these shingles. What's it cost to put a roof on? They'll tell you. What's it cost to put in a kitchen? They'll tell you. Learn what things cost. So then when you're flipping a house, you know that you're giving a good deal to the rehabbers, because you know that you did your numbers right. And if your brand's think you new and you know nothing, just get the house under contract, put a $10 deposit down, tell the person that you may or not be able to sell the house because of its condition, you're going to do your best. And if you can't close, you can't close, you lose your 10 bucks and somebody else will come, trust me, somebody else will come along and help the homeowner. Yep, and if you didn't negotiate a good deal, perhaps you can go back and renegotiate. You can go back and renegotiate. I've gone back and renegotiated. I've had deals where I couldn't find a buyer, and then I was able. That's how I started short sales in the first place. I had a couple of my deals that I could not find any rehabber in town that would buy. I'm like, man, I know I assessed that property, right? And I called the bank. I'm like, look, I got this house under contract, and I said straight out, my very first short sale I ever did in my life, I called the bank. I said, I've got someone that wants to buy this house but they won't pay more than this. I have to make this amount of money to make money. The homeowners have to move. If you guys can't come down and take, it was like going from like 65,000, I think to 36. If you can't take 36, I can't do it and the house is gonna go to sale. And without batting an eye, she goes, hang on a minute. She comes back in like one minute and she says, okay, we'll take it. And I thought, what? Did you just say yes? Yep. And Dang, I offer too much. <laughs> exactly. You guys will get better at your offers negotiating over time, but come get trained this weekend so that you have a big leg up. This next question is a good one. It's from Robin. Um, when you put bandit signs on a vacant property, who's calling you off those signs? Is it buyers? Is it sellers? Yeah. Is it both? It's all the people driving to the neighborhood. So you have to remember, any house that's in a neighborhood, like, and maybe like a level two, level three neighborhood. There's a vacant house. Every single one of you has a vacant house somewhere in your neighborhood. In my house in Florida, we live in a subdivision. There's 10 vacant houses in there right now. So everyone has vacant houses. So what happens is the people driving to and from work, they see a house, they see a sign, it's in the neighborhood. And they go, man, I'm falling behind on my payments. You know, my husband and I are getting ready to get divorced. They said they buy houses. I'm just gonna call them and see what they say. 90% of your buyers are in the neighborhoods. They're in the neighborhood where you're working. That's where your rehabbers are, and that's where your landlords are, too. All right. I think you're going to – whoops. I think you're going to like this next question. It's a little lengthy. I'm going to read it to you. This is from uh, Jasmina. I'm a single mom, too. I am ready and excited to start investing. I have my own home now and I actually rent one of my rooms in my house now, and it's paying my whole mortgage 
just renting one single room. So now I'm ready to start investing. My question to you is, I'm about to apply for an equity ladder credit from the equity I have in my current home so I could buy a house to flip. Also, I have some hard money lenders that have been calling me and they say if I can find a house to flip, they will lend me the money. Do you recommend for me to wait and do get the line of credit first or do you recommend for me to use hard money lender if I can find a house to flip fast? Okay. Getting the equity line of credit, I'm almost done. Getting the equity line of credit will take longer, I think. I'm no, working I, I, on paying 40%. I, I, I can answer the question. I don't even need to hear the rest of it. What's okay. her name? What's her first name? Jasmina. Okay, Jasmina, I would need you to listen to me very carefully, my dear. Never take out equity in your own home to do a real estate deal. If you fall flat on your ass and everything in the world goes wrong, you're going to lose your house where you're raising your children. Never, under any circumstances, when you are new, are you to take a loan out against your house, period. Not up for discussion. I don't care how much equity you have. It's The answer is never. Never put at risk where you're raising your kids, okay? Secondly, you can flip houses without money, and if you have some hard money lenders that will work with you, I would develop those relationships, and I would work with those hard money lenders, but I am telling you, my dear, take it from me. I've seen thousands of people lose their houses. Never, ever, ever borrow against the house where you are raising your children. You're a single mom. You're doing it right. You've got your mortgage paid for by a renter in there. Don't screw it up. Yeah, and that, that goes to what we were talking to Kevin about earlier. He's got that money in his pocket. Don't spend it. And if you're a seasoned investor and you've done 25 deals, you want to pull out $200,000 with equity, go for it. But when you're brand new and you're a single mom, I mean, I lost my house in foreclosure, girl. You're a single mom and, you're, and you've got your rent paid and you've got a place to raise your kids so they don't get tossed all over the place. Never, never, nothing is worth risking that. Nothing. I don't care how you credit nothing. I don't care. It's not worth the risk. The answer is not ever. And unless you're super seasoned, then you can ask me again later, and I'll ask you a ton of questions and make sure you're seasoned enough. In the meantime, develop the relationships with the people who are willing to help you. And I know a lot of people would say, I know a lot of the trainers, a lot, say, oh, yeah, pull out money in your house. Use the money in your house to make more money. But if you do something wrong or the market tanks or something unexpected happens, you're going to lose your house too. And I've seen it happen. I wouldn't be warning you if I haven't seen it happen. Don't do it. Answer is no. Adamantly, no. Absolutely. All right. I'm scrolling through these, trying to pull out some of the good questions. Because uh, some of them are quite involved answers. We may have to skip over those. Well, all you guys that have super involved questions, guess where you need to be this weekend? You need to be at the summit in Atlanta. If you're not there, shame on you. Even if you have to drive 200 miles, 500 miles, how far can you go for education? I'm mean, like, how many great questions I've answered. And nobody yeah, and, nobody's yeah, it, yeah, it's, They keep coming in. So as soon as we answer them, 10 more come in. I know. I see the number. That's really fun. I like about this Zoom thing. I can see the little Q&A. I see like two questions answered, five more popping up. It's like, oh, my gosh. Folks, just come this weekend. I swear you'll have so much fun. Yeah, we've answered 35 so far, and, and we've still got 47 I mean, more to go. I'm teaching you right now, throwing out. I give information away free all the time. I help people all the time. I'm always, always, always trying to do what's right because, you know, that old saying about you don't know a person until you walk a mile in their shoes. Well, I was a broke single mother on welfare. So I don't know, like, that's, that's as bad as low as you, you can get. I walked in those shoes for a long time. So I have walked in your shoes, and I want you to now walk in my shoes. And I'm telling you what, the grass is greener on this side of the fence. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm scanning through a lot of these questions. There's two questions that came up repeatedly. Uh, one was um, how can they have you become their mentor? or find a mentor? Well, I am an excellent mentor. 
Bill and I have something called the Apprentice Training. It's something that we would talk about at the live uh, event this weekend. And we do have a hand-holding thing where we legit hold your hand and work with you and help you through every single solitary phase of what you're doing. So if you want to come this weekend, I will talk to you about it then. Uh, and I got to tell you something. I am a great trainer because I don't let you off the hook. There's no excuses. I'm like, get your butt out there. Do what I told you to do. And all my people make money. Uh, now, we had a bunch of people, because we kept mentioning RIA groups, ask how to join their local RIA group. Well, I don't know where you are or where, where you're, you're, you're watching us from tonight, so Google local RIA groups in your area. If you're in Savannah, check out savannahria.com. If you're in Atlanta, check out atlantaria.com. If you're in Chattanooga, check out chattanoogaria.com. If you're in Charlotte, check out charlotteria.com. If you're in Tampa, check out tamparia.com. If you're in Denver, Colorado, check out coloradoria.com. Mm -hmm. well, but all major cities out there have RIA groups. They're not all created equal. Go check them out. Our RIA groups start as little as $100 a year. And really do check them out. I mean, I love RIA groups. I had one in Florida for 10 years. I have the one up here in Colorado now. I speak at them all the time. I made a huge living speaking for RIA groups and educating and training. I have so many millionaires and successful students. And RIA groups can honestly be the best thing that ever happened to you. But they are not all created equal, as Dustin said. You've got to get into a RIA group that their main focus is education and networking and helping you be successful. Yep, I'm getting up. Uh, I'm scrolling down to the bottom of the questions. We're getting a lot of wows and thank yous, and they really appreciate it. Looking forward to meeting you. Yay! So I kind of summarized a lot of the questions because uh, we just can't get to them because they just keep coming in. Um, but if you're ready to wrap things up, I am too, and we can do that. Yeah, yeah I'm good. All right, so everybody, if you see the screen, uh, a lot of you are asking if, if Dwan and Bill are coming to a city near you soon. And I don't know where you are, so I couldn't tell you that. But uh, they were just up in Charlotte with us very recently. They're in Atlanta with us uh, this weekend and, and came and saw us twice so far. If you're in Chattanooga, drive on down for this two-day event. The prices are on your screen. If you're a silver Chattanooga RIA member, 49 bucks for two days for you and your significant other. You can't beat that. Take the short trip, come down here and learn. Uh, and stay overnight. Don't try to drive back. Uh, that goes, same thing if you're in Charlotte and miss this. We're about three and a half hours away. Come visit us. If you're in Savannah, it's probably about four hours away. Come see us. And if you are in the Tampa area, uh, I will be attempting to get Dwan and Bill on the schedule later this summer or in the early fall, if that's okay with you, Dwan. Yeah, that sounds perfect to me. All right. So uh, I apologize for not being able to get to everybody's questions, but, man, they were coming in as fast as we could get them answered. So um, that's what this call is all about. We do try to get as many answers as possible. It looks like we answered 45 of them, but we got about 45 left because they keep coming. But come this weekend, uh, Bill and Dwan do a great training. It's very exciting. They're both a hoot. They're hilarious. They're funny. It's infotainment. It's good training. <laughs> I like that, infotainment. Infotainment. It's informative and it's entertaining. That's hilarious. It's not boring, like going to a tax seminar or something. Oh my gosh! I know. You guys will love it. You'll love it. So come check it out. They'll do their best to answer all your questions live during the training, during breaks, whenever they can. And uh, I'll be there myself, as will many of our members. And uh, we look forward to meeting you, helping you build your buyers list, helping you get rid of some of your deals, helping. Uh, set you on your way in your new real estate investing career. And, you know, I also just want to thank all of you for being on the call. I really appreciate the questions. Those were awesome questions. And, uh, yeah, we'll be there, and we'll answer as many questions. We'll answer all the questions you can think of. So it'll be a fun weekend. you got to come. It's going to be great. Dustin does great events. And uh, we'll answer questions, and we'll have fun. And we're going to teach and teach and teach. You won't even know what hit you. Well, I appreciate you spending so much time with us this evening. 
Uh, it's been great, and I really appreciate everybody's great questions. I apologize that we could not answer every single one, but uh, we're almost at two hours here. So um, try to get you guys out of here on time. We're a little bit over time, but uh, these calls frequently go between an hour and a half and two hours. But uh, again, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy evening to spend it with us. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please say so via the chat interface. A lot of you have been chatting with me tonight, asking lots of good questions. So, um, and I know you can't, Dewan can't hear you give her a round of applause, but you can say a few nice things to her via the chat interface. She'd really appreciate it. Dewan, I appreciate you being here. It's been great. I look forward to seeing you this weekend. Hopefully you two will make some time. Maybe we can get uh, go out for dinner one night. Oh, yeah. Someplace nice after hours, unwind yeah. a little bit, have some wine or some good beer. Yeah, good we'll meal. do that. Ah, some good wine. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> well, thank all of you guys. I appreciate it. I see the questions. I see the chat still pouring in, but like you said, you just you can't answer them all. We're out of time. And I want to remind everybody at home, again, sign up for this two-day summit, two full days. For $49 if you're silver, for $29 if you're gold, that is good for two people if you are a member. If you're a non-member, it's 99 bucks for one of you, 99 bucks if you want to bring somebody. But if you join, you can come at these member prices too and have a membership for the entire year. So that's good for Savannah Rhea, Atlanta Rhea, Tampa Rhea, Chattanooga Rhea, and um, Charlotte Rhea. So please join us. Also, I want to remind you, that uh, next month we're doing big beginning investor group online on the fourth Tuesday again. We're going to have a fairly interesting topic. And uh, Dwan, I don't even know how familiar you are with this topic. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about it. And one of our good friends here locally, he's known as the godfather of wholesaling. He's done several thousand wholesale deals over his career as well. He's very uh -huh. well known here locally. His name is Mike Chawanka. Uh -huh. And He's doing, he's going to introduce us to the topic of cryptocurrency and what the heck it has to do with real estate investing. I've been hearing about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for months now. Is it a fad? Is it the future? What the heck is it? Should I care? And what the heck does it have to do with real estate investing? Well, that sounds like that will be a very interesting call. Yeah, because I don't know if it's a fad. If it's, if it's a gimmick, if it's multi-level marketing, I just know I've been hearing about it a lot lately, and Mike is someone I know and trust and respect, mm -hmm. and he's using it in his real estate investing business as no. currency. So I'm eager to I hear more about what he knows. It. Yep, so he's going to give us next month on the Beginning Investor Group an introduction to cryptocurrency and what the heck it means and what it's all about and how it fits in with what we're already doing. And uh, he says it's making a lot of millionaires right now. It'll only kind of add to what you're currently doing with real estate investing and make it a lot easier to do deals in the seller's market. Nice. So that's coming next month. I don't have, you know, I, I know about as much about it as everybody else on the call. So it's going to be new to me too. I'm looking forward to it. That's our good friend, Mike Chuanka. So, Duan, I want to thank you again for being here tonight. I want you to tell, you, give, uh, give uh, Bill a big pat on the back for me and tell him uh, I appreciate him being in town in Atlanta with us twice. Uh, I he, know. He's great. He's a trooper. He was up in Charlotte uh, with us a few weeks back and uh, did the two-day event up there. And we look forward to having you, you guys back in Tampa again real soon. But I'm looking forward to seeing you this weekend. So, I'm excited. I'll be there with bells on. I hope to see all y'all there, too. So, Register, come hang out, come see us, come meet us. Summit.atlantaria.com. That's summit.atlantaria.com. We hope to see you there. So thank you, everybody, again, for attending tonight. Thank you, Duan. We will see you soon. Good Bye. night, everybody, and God bless. Bye.